Marilyn is going to tour through many of the illustrious universities. She was an undergraduate at Berkeley and a grad student at Columbia, and she's going to talk to us now about pop order and non Okay, thanks. Um, okay.
visible here, if these more rare positive fluctuations, the more red spots. If I looked at that same histogram, um, for the positively skewed one, it's blue here. There's an increased area in the tail, but the peak value of the PDF has shifted um, back. The most likely value is slightly negative. And if this parameter is negative, then I get exactly the opposite case. So this is one example of something that's non-Gaussian. And people go out and look in the microwave background for if this type of non-Gaussianity exists, what type of constraints can you put on this parameter? And it's actually constrained quite well. Um, you can get a little bit more insight into what non-Gaussianity does by um, doing something called a peak background or split approach, which is to um, remember that for a Gaussian field, different Fourier modes are strictly uncorrelated. But that's not true for a non-Gaussian field. So imagine taking some fluctuation of potential phi g, and I split it into the part which is from a long wavelength mode and the part from a short wavelength mode. If I do this to the Gaussian part, then if I live in, uh, if I, the non-Gaussian field that I see is going to have a sum of terms. So if I'm an observer on top of a long wavelength fluctuation here by L, I will locally see small fluctuations that look like this Gaussian piece the quadratic term is non-Gaussian, but I also get this coupling between um, the short and the long wavelength mode, which is different than what you would see in a Gaussian case. So in particular, if I measure the variance of this field, then um, I, I will find that the variance of the small scale fluctuations varies from place to place according to the value of the long wavelength field. So this is really different than if I have um, Gaussian statistics the small scale power varies from place to place, but not in a way that's correlated with the long wavelength modes. Okay, so on top of this piece here means that on top of positive phi fluctuations, I see slightly more power, and on top of negative phi fluctuations, I see slightly less power. Um, okay. So just a quick summary of this example. You, this type of non-Gaussianity gives you a skewness, which wasn't present in the Gaussian case. And one, another effect is that there's a correlation between the small scale power and the long wavelength um, fluctuation. This is just um, one example that's not particularly general. It's simple. There's just one parameter, this number of FNL. Um, but it's not particularly general. One, one reason that it is interesting is that there's a theorem that if you have single field inflation, this parameter FNL, which comes from measuring the three-point function of squeeze limit, has to vanish. Um, so a detection of FNL greater than, say, a few, uh, where you're confident that there aren't contributions from other secondary anisotropy, so something from a, a primordial FNL greater than a few, rules out all models of single field inflation. So that's uh, quite interesting. This was first pointed out in a paper by Wamal Lusana and a uh, similar paper by the Um, so uh, that's, that's one example. I'm going to talk about two other simple extensions to this um, that both share a common feature, which is that the four-point function of the uh, tri-spectrum is important. The first is to consider, instead of just this quadratic term here, uh, qubit coupling, and I'll call that coefficient GNL. It subtracts this piece to keep the mean and the variance of this field unchanged to lowest order in GNL. The second case, which I'll call tau NL, is where I have uh, initial statistics which are given by the sum of two fields, one of which, this little phi, is Gaussian, and this other field, sigma, contributes a non-Gaussian piece with non-Gaussianity given by this parameter, FNL. I call it FNL for this, or we call it a little bit. Um, so how do these look? Well, if I apply this map to the Gaussian field, if GNL is positive, I get something that looks like this, with positive kurtosis. So positive kurtosis means I have more extreme fluctuations that are both positive and negative, so there's more purple and more red spots, but fewer fluctuations which are close to the mean. Um, negative kurtosis gives me just the opposite. I have something that has very few extreme fluctuations, either negative or positive, but many more fluctuations which are near the mean. Um, and there are constraints on this parameter from the microwave background also. You can carry through the same logic of splitting modes into their short and long wavelength pieces to see how the mode coupling looks in this GNL case. And here what you find is interesting. 
the variance of small scale fluctuations also varies from place to place, but here in a way that's quadratic with the long wavelength mode. The first term that shows up for uh, that varies linearly in the long wavelength uh, potential or curvature is the skewness. So GNL in a GNL um, cosmology, you have no on average there's no skewness in the field, but if I'm standing on top of this long wavelength positive fluctuations, it looks like I live in a universe with positive skewness with an effective value of FNL here that varies according to the long wavelength fluctuation. And over here, it looks like I live in a uh, universe uh, with a small scale statistics look like they have a negative <coughs> skewness that, of course, averages to zero. Um, the Tawano case um, has is a little bit more complicated because there are two parameters now. One is this coefficient of the nonlinear coupling, and the second parameter is the ratio of power coming from this field to this field. So I'm making the really simplified assumption that the two fields that generate the statistics are completely uncorrelated, so the cross power spectrum vanishes, and that the but that the power spectrum of each of these fields are just proportional by some constant C. So there are two parameters in this model, which I can write in terms of FNL tilde and the ratio of power, or in terms of FNL, which is what would be the measured skewness in this model, and tau NL, which is what would be the measured kurtosis. So if you compare it to the original, the one non-Gaussian field case, in this tau NL scenario, you have, you have identical skewness, the phi spectrum shape is identical, but the kurtosis is boosted in amplitude. If you actually work out the shape dependence of this tri-spectrum, it's identical to the FNL model, but the amplitude is now boosted by an amount that depends on um, the ratio of power coming from these two fields. Um, so the statistics are identical, but the four-point function has an independent amplitude. In this case, um, we still have the same coupling between short and long wavelength modes, but now the small-scale statistics vary with the long wavelength fluctuations just in this field sigma. Um, whereas the total potential, which determines things like the dark matter density, is given by phi plus sigma here. So that's different, and we'll do something different. This case um, is nice to look at also. So here's the Gaussian field. This panel show is a uh, field with identical variance to this one, but it has a positive skewness and it has the kurtosis, which is just given by FNL squared. So this panel is just the FNL model. This panel also has the same variance as these two. The same, these two panels have identical skewness, but in this panel, the kurtosis is boosted in amplitude. The tau NL parameter is larger than FNL squared. So this guy has the same skewness as this one, but a larger kurtosis. And that's visible in that there are more, the larger kurtosis gives you slightly more rare positive fluctuations and a few more rare negatives. And, and there are also constraints on this parameter that do not data. So here's a yes. Yeah. So all, all of these. So by convention, um, the way that these um, the, the convention is that you should think of FNL as being multiplied by ten to the minus five, and GNL and tau NL as being multiplied by ten to the minus ten. So if I want this. The, the power spectra, the variance of these fluctuations is 10 to the minus 10. So if I want this term to be small compared to this one and this one, then I need the combination of FNL times the square root of the variance to be a small number. So FNL of 100 means that something can just stand in one part of 10 to the 3. Is it? So, and then tau NL goes like FNL squared. So it looks like these are large numbers, but if you think about it, it's actually saying a lot. <laughs> So this table just summarizes the three cases that I'll talk about from here on, which are FNL, GNL, TAUNL. So this is the um, expression that defines these three models. They have a skew, the two FNL and TAUNL have identical skewness. GNL has no skewness. They all have kurtosis, um, but the amplitudes are different depending on the parameters. And finally, um, the other physical effect is the coupling between short and long wavelength scales. FNL, I have a variance of var that varies with the long wavelength potential. GNL has a skewness that varies with the long wavelength potential. And tau NL has a variance that varies with just part of the long wavelength potential, the part coming from the sigma field. Um, so the reason these um, are simplified cases of what you might get from some type of initial conditions that are nice because there's uh, different, they, they each give examples of different types of non gaussian and they're easy to implement, and that they're all just a local map in real space. I take a 
them, but they're not particularly general. But you might wonder whether something like this can actually arise. And all of these ethanol, GNL, palynol um, types of initial conditions can come from variants in the Kerbaton model. So the Kerbaton model is a two-field model of inflation, where um, the inflaton dominates the background energy density and drives the exponential expansion during inflation. But the Kerbaton is the one that sources the perturbations which give rise to structure. So here you decouple the problem of driving inflation from generating perturbation. So the Kerbaton is a second light field that gets excited during inflation and later decays, giving rise to the perturbations that we see. If the Kerbaton potential is exactly quadratic, then you can get initial conditions which look like the FNL type. If the Kerbaton potential is not quadratic, then I would just where you get some cancellations, you could come up with, um, you can manage this quadratic term and get GNL type initial conditions. And finally, if I allow some perturbations from the inflaton to contribute to the perturbations that we see that give rise to structure, then you get something that looks like Kavanaugh, where I have perturbations coming from the Gaussian inflaton plus these terms coming from the Kerbaton. Um, and it's also important to notice that the, uh, that single field consistency relation, that for a single field inflation, FNL has to be vanishingly small, also applies to GNL and tau um, these, these parameters, if these were measured to be very large, it would call into question single field inflation. Um, and there are other consistency relations that apply to how um, tau NL should compare to FNL squared, um, which is interesting. Does that always true? This this? Yeah. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so, so this is so this is the, the Suyama Yamaguchi inequality was shown by these guys in like the delta n formalism. We actually with Kendrick and Matias we have a short paper that shows that um, this this statement has to be true. It doesn't have to do with inflation. Um, it, it's just a statement about uh, mass. Um, there's there's a slight there's a there's another term that shows up here depending on how close to the squeeze limit you are. I'm happy to talk about it later. It's a little bit technical, but the, the statement is. Um, it, it's simple, but it would take a few minutes to explain. But it's generically true and it doesn't have to do with inflation. You check that it's true in our model? <laughs> Which model? It's the model <coughs> that um, you're forgetting the amendments and then you get these spikes. Okay. So when you smooth them with the spikes, you get something akin to your signal formula, except that the signal is related by a control parameter <coughs> to the underlying uh, uh, isotherpic field. And so that means that there is a relationship which is not just your uh, single parameter case. Yeah, so this, this. So I don't know, did you check that out? This, this statement is true. It doesn't have anything to do with how the perturbations are generated. If I just, if I measure this parameter in a map, and I measure this parameter, it's similar to the statement that the that power spectra are always positive. It's, yeah. it's, it's a, it's a, it's a it comes from a Cauchy inequality. Yeah, yeah, this is only true in a small region. In other words, uh, it, this is an approximation to the the model. Um, this, so the... I mean, it's probably true because the numbers are Yeah, small. The, the proof that we have doesn't depend on anything to do with inflation. It's just a statement about... So you're saying that arbitrary non-locality, or, or sorry, arbitrary local non-locality somehow obeys? Yeah, so, so the way I think about it is if you think about um, FNL is a measure of how the small scale, the, the FNL bisection is largest in the squeeze limit, and it's a measure of how the small scale power varies according to the long wavelength modes. Tau NL is really telling you about how the small scale power varies according to the long wavelength power. And there must be a contribution to that that comes from how the small scale power varying with the long wavelength um, so if you if you construct a, a measure of this, um, it definite it has to have contributions in order to come up on Right. We I, maybe we should talk about it after. <coughs> Pretty simply. A dark matter. 
some threshold to collapse. Um, so we know from looking at these pictures that non-gaussianity changes the number density of these regions which are above the collapse threshold. So here with positive skewness or positive kurtosis, I have more extreme um, positive fluctuations, which should be where dark matter halos form. So to the extent that we know how to map between the number of these peak regions and the number of halos, we can see how primordial non-gaussianity affects the halo abundance. And there's a simple prescription for doing this, um, which is called the um, press sector approach, which relates the area in the tail of the probability distribution function to the number of dark matter halos. So I smooth the density field on some physical scale, M, and then I look at how much, um, what's the fraction of area that's in this tail above the threshold for collapse. And that gives me a way to write down the abundance of dark matter payloads. Um, so the, the press checker prescription works pretty well, but is not super precise. So this is a plot from an old paper by Jenkins from about 10 years ago, which shows the abundance of dark matter halos as a function of their mass. The, these green curves are the results of end body simulation. And the black curve is the press checker mass function that you would get from carrying through this logic. So it qualitatively reproduces the halo abundance, but um, is not precisely accurate on these scales. And we needed simulations to convince ourselves of that. Nevertheless, um, uh, many people have continued to use this approach since press checker works pretty well. That continue to use this approach to see how to take a non-Gaussian probability distribution and see how many more halos you would get with a non-Gaussian probability distribution relative to a Gaussian one. And this seems to work fairly well. So what's shown on this plot is the um, overabundance of halos you would get with FNL cosmology as a function of mass. So um, if you're at zero, there's no correction. And the data points are the output of simulations. This is from a platform paper by Annalise Mikulicic and collaborators. And these uh, different curves show different prescriptions for calculating the change to the mass function from primordial non uh, the, yeah. um, So in order to carry through this logic, you need to have an expression for the non-Gaussian probability distribution. Um, and if you had an infinite set of moments or cumulus for your probability distribution, you could write down a closed form expression for the PDF. Um, unfortunately, we don't have, typically have an infinite set of cumulus. So it's, we have to truncate this expansion for the PDF in terms of entire moments. And there have been a few approaches to doing this, which are shown here in pink and green. They work OK. Um, motivated, there, there were some issues with some of the existing um, asymptotic expansion or using the Edgeworth series prescriptions for, for writing down the mass function. Uh, so Kendrick and I uh, were inspired to try to find something that might work a little bit better. So we tried um, a really simple thing, which was to take, the, take a given series for the probability distribution <coughs> function, we use the Edgeworth, and instead of truncating the ex expansion for the PDF, we truncated the expansion for log of the PDF. And this happens to have some better properties um, at, for, at the high mass end, which I'll show briefly. So it, it's a simple idea, but um, it works. And we, we call this the log as work mass function. So um, the, these analytic arguments are nice, but at the end of the day, to trust anything, you really need to compare um, whatever we write down press or whatever we so um, I'll show a few plots showing the same thing. In each case, what's on the y-axis is the correction, the non -ga the ratio of the non-Gaussian mass function to the Gaussian one. So if it's one, there's no effect of primordial non-Gaussianity. So this panel shows the mass function with initial um, skewness just coming from FNL. This is a pretty large value. What you can see is that the um, effect of FNL is to create more extremely massive halos. The effect is more prominent at the high mass tail and at higher redshift. And negative FNL gives you um, fewer extremely massive halos. The curves that are shown in this plot, the red dashed curve, is the is an uh, existing prescription using the, the Edgeworth mass function. And the blue one is our new uh, log Edgeworth. They both agree pretty well with the data. You can see there's some funny behavior down here for large negative FNL, which is why we tried, why we considered instead of this new mass function. But it looks pretty good over the observationally relevant range. Um, so in 
in this panel, we show the results uh, from simulations of the curves for GNL initial conditions. So remember, GNL just introduces a kurtosis. So having a positive or negative kurtosis, but no skewness, has a, can have significant effects on the mass function. And um, in this case, the new log is worth uh, analytic description works uh, a lot better in describing the data than the old one. You can see that um, they diverge too much in high masses. Um, and finally, this case is the FNL and tau -NL model, where tau -NL is not given by FNL squared, but it's an independent parameter. So it has the same skewness as in that previous panel, but now the kurtosis is boosted in amplitude. Um, so the, what you can see is that the effects of having a kurtosis, which is boosted, are visible as different from just having the skewness given by FNL. And again, the, of the two analytic descriptions, the Edgeworth one does some, does some funny stuff that seems to be cured by the log Edgeworth max function. So we conclude that um, we can model the effects of these three different types of chromodian log pretty well with the mass function using this prescription. Um, and it works, all of the values are shown are for really huge amounts of non Gaussianity, which probably, um, which are beyond the CMB constraints, but it works at, for high and low values of the parameter. Um, if you, or you might wonder whether these different types of non Gaussianity conditions look different in the mass function. So here I put all of these plots on top of each other. And the point to take away is that a, a model with uh, tau and L which is bigger than FNL squared, can actually be made to look like a model with just FNL, <coughs> just by making FNL bigger or smaller. GNL looks a little different. The effects of kurtosis are less important at low masses, but become um, more important at high masses. I think in practice, it's probably not possible to distinguish these, but, um, but in principle, the, their effects are, are different. So they count boys instead of payloads, right? What would you expect? Um, I, yeah, I would think that GNL would be worse at voice to some extent, just because, um, so like with, with FNL, you get that huge change in the tail, but also the peak shifts back. Right. But with GNL, the peak stays at zero. So it's not, it's not obvious to me what would happen. Do you know what I mean? Like, because voids are, they don't have to be that extremely under to get a voice, right? Depending upon how you define the voice.
just this exact prediction. So this, the prediction for what this coefficient is works, works really well. Um, well enough that it's been used to try to constrain primordial leg identity. So this is a plot from a paper by Amshel Slosar and others using um, Sloan LRGs to look for this type of um, large scale power, anomalously large scale power, to be attributed to primordial leg identity. And uh, using these and other data sets, they get this constraint on the parameter FNL, which is pretty awesome because this is a this is a new idea, but this these bounds are already competitive with what the microwave background alone is doing. So this is a powerful technique. Um, so what do you get something similar in these other models? Well if I have GNL initial conditions, then what varies from place to place in the long wave potential is actually the skewness. So if skewness affects the abundance of halos, which we know it does, then what we pick up here is a second term um, that ter in how the halos fluctuate, which depends on the derivative of the mass function with respect to FNL, or the local skewness, um, coming from this coefficient here. So we can check whether we see this type of scaling in simulations. And what's shown here is uh, that identical plot, so the scale-dependent halo bias, but with GNL initial conditions. So again, what you see the black curve is the Gaussian case, and the red and blue are for positive and negative values of GNL. You again see the 1 over k square coming from the fact that this is the potential here and not the density field. Um, so that part definitely agrees. And then we can ask whether the amplitude of this uh, 1 over k squared coefficient agrees with the prediction, which is the derivative of the mass function with respect to that panel. So that's what's shown on this panel. Um, the blue points are the coefficients of this term measured from the halo bias in simulations. And the green points are the derivative of the mass function with the prediction from this peak background split argument for the derivative of the mass function also measured from simulations. So the blue and the green points all lie on this line. This is a function of halo mass. And so we conclude that indeed this, this, this approach to predicting scale dependent bias works quite well. Um, the red curve is an attempt at an analytic model. at these mass scales, at low masses, at high masses, the uh, analytic approach for. Um, so uh, there, there are some other interesting things about GNL you know, that are slightly different than FNL, but in large part, this, this approach um, of thinking about halos forming, just halo formation just depending on the local matter density, the local um, power spectrum, the local students, and so on, uh, seems to work pretty well. So uh, the final thing that I'll talk about is uh, stochastic halo bias, which can come from primordial mode identity. So recall um, the FNO model, you have a small scale power that varies with the long wavelength potential, which gives the following um, expression for how the number of halos fluctuates. In the Talano case, something slightly different happens. We have the small scale power varies from place to place but just according to the long wavelength fluctuations coming from that curvaton field. Um, so we can't just replace this term that tells, we have the original Gaussian bias term, and then we have the second term here, which depends on just the curvaton part of the potential fluctuation, not the total potential here. So we can't just use Poisson's equation to rela relate this term to um, delta. There's uh, some, there are two fields that determine the density, the, uh, infoton plus curvaton fluctuation, but it's only the curvaton that modulates the power. So, um, what this means is uh, that there's going to be stochasticity in how halo cluster with respect to the dark matter. Because measuring the dark matter will only give you this part of halo clustering, but you need something else. You would need something else to determine how the part of the dark matter, the, the power spectrum, varies. So here's a cartoon just showing that again. Um, in the non-stochastic case, you have the gravitational potential and the dark matter, which trace each other completely. And both of these determine how the halo electric fluctuates. In this case, we have the total potential, which is in yellow, which of course follows the dark matter. But part of this total potential is coming from this field sigma. And it's just the field sigma that tells you how the power spectrum fluctuates. So it's going to create the halo distribution depends on both the dark matter and the green one, sigma, so there's some stochasticity. Um, and this was uh, this was first uh, predicted by uh, Chris Hirata and his student, which is like Tovich, and Um So here's the stochastic term that 
vanishingly small. And the red and blue solid points are FNL only initial conditions, so one field, one non Gaussian field generating the fluctuation. And you can see that again the stochasticity is basically is vanishingly small. But in the case where these crosses are the points where I have FNL and the second field giving me something like Tauno, which would give rise to the stochasticity. So there clearly is stochasticity. There's a stochasticity at the large scales coming from having this second field. Um, so that, that part of the prediction is clearly verified. So you, you probably said that it's sort of this happening by the time. What are the similar systems when you use the visual of this? Yeah, so, so we ran, Kendra ran um, a bunch of bad body simulations. We have, I actually can't remember the exact numbers, but we ran, used Gadget and have a big 1600 megaparsec box with a billion particles. Um, and then we had um, a board of 10, I think, simulations.
difficult to measure clusters on very large scales. But that's a technical problem that the observers will solve for us. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not in the Thank you. 